In the 21st dynasty of the pharaohs, 3,000 years ago, there took place one night at a temple, the funeral of Henut Tawi, the lady of the two lands. Compared to the great rulers of Egypt, her burial was a modest affair. But just like the pharaohs, she too was mummified and her body placed in the depths of a desert tomb in the belief that it would give her immortality. And in an unexpected way, it has. Her mummified body waited throughout recorded history. The Greeks and Romans, the Dark and Middle Ages, the Renaissance and Napoleon. Until in the early 19th century, her tomb was plundered. The King of Bavaria bought the ornate sarcophagus with the mummy inside. He gave it to a museum in Munich, where for another century, Henut Tawi lay undisturbed. Then a German scientist, Dr. Svetla Balabanova, made a discovery which was to baffle Egyptologists and call into question whole areas of science, from archaeology to chemistry and botany. She discovered that the body of Henut Tawi contained large quantities of cocaine and nicotine. The surprise was not just that the Egyptians had taken drugs, but that these drugs come from tobacco and coca, plants completely unknown outside the Americas until thousands of years later. Unheard of until Sir Walter Raleigh introduced smoking from the New World, or until cocaine was imported in the Victorian era. It was seemingly impossible for the ancient Egyptians to get hold of these substances. And so began the mystery, the mystery of the cocaine mummies. It was in Munich in 1992 that researchers began a huge project to investigate the contents of mummies. When, as part of their study, they wanted to test for drugs, it was no surprise that they turned to toxicologist Dr. Svetla Balabanova for help. As the inventor of groundbreaking new methods for the detection of drugs in hair and sweat, she was highly respected in her field. Dr. Balabanova took samples from the mummies, which she pulverized and dissolved to make a solution. As she had done countless times before, she ran the samples through a system which uses antibodies to detect the presence of drugs and other substances. Then, as a backup, the samples were put through the GCMS machine, which can accurately identify substances by determining their molecular weight. As the graph emerged, with peaks showing that drugs were present, and as the printer spewed out the analysis of just which drugs, something seemed to have gone very wrong. The first positive results, of course, were a shock for me. I had not expected to find nicotine and cocaine, but that's what happened. I was absolutely sure it must be a mistake. Balabanova ran the tests again and again. She sent fresh samples to three other labs, but the results kept being confirmed. The drugs were there. So she went ahead and published a paper. The reaction was a sharp reminder that science 
is a conservative world. I got a pile of letters that were almost threatening, insulting letters, saying that all this was nonsense, that I was fantasizing, that it was quite impossible, because it was proven that before Columbus these plants were not found anywhere in the world apart from America. From toxicologists to anthropologists, everyone thought the same thing. The first thing you think of is that this is it's just mad. It's, it's, it's wrong. Um, there's contamination present. Maybe there's fraud present of some kind. But you don't think that cocaine can actually be present in an Egyptian mummy. Yet Balabanova herself had been worried about contamination. First, she checked all the lab equipment. But being a forensic toxicologist, that wasn't all she did. Balabanova had learned her trade working for the police and had been trained in the methods they use to investigate a suspicious death. She had been taught how vital it is when an autopsy is carried out to know whether the dead person has consumed or been given any drugs or poisons. And she had also been taught that a special forensic technique exists which can show that the deceased has consumed a drug and can rule out contamination at the same time. So, anxious to ensure that her tests on the mummies were beyond reproach, she used this very technique. It's called the hair shaft test. Drugs and other substances that are consumed by humans get into the hair protein, where they remain for months, or after death, forever. Hair samples from a body can be washed in alcohol, and the washing solution itself then tested. If the washing solution is clean but the hair comes up positive, then the drug must be inside the hair shaft, which means the person must have consumed it during their lifetime. It's considered proof against contamination before or after death. The hair shaft test is accepted. If you know that you've taken your hair sample from this particular individual and the hair shaft sh is shown to contain the drug, well then it is proof positive that the person has taken that drug. So it is accepted in law. It's put people into prison. The hair shaft test on the bodies of a couple in Jersey showed their two sons had drugged them before killing them. And aside from the Newell case, the technique has been used in countless others over the last 25 years. Since it's also used for drug tests on addicts, company employees and in sport, to suggest it could produce false results was for Balabanova unthinkable. There's no way there can be mistake in this test. This method is widely accepted and has been used thousands of times. If the results are not genuine, the explanation must lie elsewhere and not in my tests, because I'm 100% certain about the results. If the fault was not in the tests, what else could lie behind the impossibility of mummies containing drugs from the plants coca and tobacco from a continent not discovered until over a thousand years after the end of the Egyptian civilization? In search of an explanation, we went to one of the UK's foremost experts on mummies, a person who had spent years rummaging around in the bodies of ancient Egyptians. 
Rosalie David. When I was first informed that cocaine had been found in Egyptian mummies, I was absolutely astounded. It seemed quite impossible that this should be the case. Skeptical of Balabanova's results, Rosalie David decided to get some samples from her own mummies and have them tested, especially for Equinox. They're so tightly fixed mm. to the... What we're going to do is to provide tissue samples and a hair sample from a number of mummies in the Manchester Museum collection. I should be very surprised to find that they had cocaine in them. It looks almost... Yeah. Oh, you're near the ribs there, aren't you? It would be a while before the results came back from the lab. Rosalie David's motive was not only to get an independent check on Balabanova's methods, she also wanted to run the same tests, but on different mummies. Yes. There we go. For she had more than one idea about how Balabanova could have got a misleading result. I think there were two ideas which sprang immediately to mind. Uh, one was that possibly something in the, the tests uh, could give a false result. Uh, and the second was that possibly the, the mummies that had been tested were not truly ancient Egyptian, that they could be some of these false, uh, relatively modern mummies, and so the traces of cocaine could be in those individuals. What Rosalie David was referring to happened in Egypt in Victorian times. It was a gruesome operation to supply the antique dealers of Luxor. When 19th century travelers began to descend on Egypt in search of mummies and other valuables, the dealers might not always have the genuine article available. And so the crudely mummified body of a recently dead Egyptian might be procured instead. For a shriveled corpse would greatly increase the value of a genuine but empty sarcophagus. Sometimes collectors would buy only limbs or other mummified spare parts. These are doubly suspect, for the trade in fake mummies, particularly separate heads and limbs, has an even older origin. Eating the flesh of mummies was a common 16th century practice in Europe. People believed the mummies contained a black tar called bitumen, and so thought powder made from the ground up bodies would cure various illnesses. This is the very origin of the word mummy, from the Persian for bitumen, mummia. And although it actually made people sick, a roaring trade in powdered mummia grew up, supplied by body parts and tissue shipped in bulk from Egypt. The temptation to resort to fakes was high. Very soon, the demand outstripped the supply, and certainly in the 16th century, a French physician undertook a study of this trade and he found that in fact they were burying the bodies uh, of convicted criminals in the sand, they were producing mummies and these then became a source for the medicinal ingredient. Could it be that the mummies Balabanova had tested were fakes? Carbon dating on mummies often produces incorrect results, so archaeologists rely on the provenance, knowing what tomb and excavation the mummy comes from, and on examining the mummification techniques. So the only way for Rosalie David to check out her theory about fakes was to travel to Munich 
to see for herself the seven mummies that were the cause of all the fuss. The Munich mummies, as they are known, belong to the city's Egyptian museum, which is housed in the old palace of King Ludwig I of Bavaria, who started the collection. Inside the museum, Rosalie David found the sarcophagus of Henot Tawi, the Lady of the Two Lands. She discovered from the museum catalogue that the coffin was bought by King Ludwig from an English traveller called Dodwell in 1845. There was no record of an exact excavation, but Henot Tawi was said to come from a tomb reserved for the priests and priestesses of the god Amun in Thebes. But while being shown the other coffins, Rosalie David discovered that apart from Henot Tawi, most of the Munich mummies are of unknown origin and some of the tested mummies turned out to be only detached heads. According to the museum, research had revealed inscriptions, amulets and complex embalming methods which they claimed proved the mummies were ancient. The investigation shows clearly that the Munich mummies are real Egyptian mummies, no fakes. No modern mummies, they come from ancient Egypt. The obvious way to prove this was to show the mummies to Rosalie David. But all the museum would let her see were empty sarcophagi. On grounds of religious respects, we don't show the mummies here in our galleries. That's one point. And the other is that we don't allow to film the mummies and to show them on TV. This wasn't always so, for the mummies had already been shown on television. But this German film announcing Balabanova's results had caused more than a little fuss. And so now, even though giving access might defeat the accusation of harboring bogus mummies, it seemed the museum wanted nothing more to do with research they politely pointed out was far from respectable. It's not absolutely proven and I think it's not absolutely scientifically correct. Rosalie David had to make do with research papers and books from the museum. Were the Munich mummies fakes? Despite her initial suspicions, she decided that on balance they probably were the real thing. From the documentation and the research which has been carried out on the Munich mummies, it seems evident that they are probably genuine because they have packages of the viscera inside them, some with wax images of the gods on them, and also uh, the state of mummification itself uh, is very good. I would say that the detached heads we can't comment on, but the complete bodies probably are genuine. And if that wasn't enough, it turned out the results from the Munich mummies were not the only evidence from the dead. The anthropologists who had originally ordered the tests didn't continue the project, but Balabanova alongside her normal research into the metabolism of drugs, started requesting samples of other ancient human remains from universities. And it was then that she got more results from Egypt. She tested tissue from 134 naturally preserved bodies from an excavated cemetery in the Sudan, once part of the Egyptian empire. Although from a later period, the bodies were still many centuries before Columbus discovered the Americas. About a third of them tested positive for nicotine and cocaine. 
Balabanova was mystified by the presence of cocaine in Africa, but thought she might have a way of explaining the nicotine. As well as Egypt and the Sudan, she also tested bodies from China, Germany and Austria, spanning a period from 3,700 BC to 1100 AD. A percentage of the bodies from all these other regions also contained nicotine. I continued to work on it because I wanted to be sure about my results. And after I had tested 3,000 samples, I was absolutely certain that the tobacco plant was known in Europe and Africa long before Columbus. Far from being solved, the mystery that began in Egypt was spreading. Balabanova was suggesting that an unknown type of tobacco had grown in Africa, Europe and Asia thousands of years ago. But every schoolchild knows that tobacco was discovered in the New World. She was asking for a substantial slice of botany and history to be completely rewritten. Would anyone back her up? Dr. Balabanova had told us that we might find the secret behind the mysterious presence of nicotine and cocaine in Egyptian mummies in the ancient plants of Africa. Perhaps there had been drug plants which the Egyptians used, but which vanished along with their civilization. This led to a much more basic question. Were the Egyptians, the great pharaohs and pyramid builders, really users and abusers of drugs? The clues can be found hidden in the walls of the Grand Temple of Karnak. The entire building is covered in depictions of the lotus flower, from the tops of the vast columns to the pictograms on the walls. Until recently, Egyptologists took this most commonplace Egyptian symbol to have only a religious meaning. But according to some, the true significance of the lotus has been overlooked. The lotus was a very powerful narcotic which was used in ancient Egypt and presumably was widespread in this use because we see many scenes of individuals holding a cup and dropping a lotus flower into the cup which contained wine and this would be a way of releasing the narcotic. The ancient Egyptians certainly used drugs. As well as lotus, they had mandrake and cannabis, and there is a strong suggestion that they also used opium. So although it is very surprising to find cocaine in mummies, the other elements were certainly in use. So the pharaohs clearly indulged in drugs. Hashish, which Balabanova also found in the mummies, is an Egyptian tradition which has survived through thousands of years. Although nowadays in public, pipes tend to be filled with nothing more than tobacco. By contrast, the narcotic blue lotus flower, once so essential at parties, is now on the verge of extinction. And if it could disappear, why not other drug plants? We decided to pursue Balabanova's unusual theory that an ancient species of tobacco might once have grown in the old world. 
Small amounts of nicotine are present in a wide variety of plants and foods, but the high concentrations sought by smokers can only be found in tobacco. The idea of a lost species came to Balabanova because the concentrations in the bodies from Asia and Europe were similar to modern-day smokers. But one thing had puzzled her. At 35 times the dose for smokers, the amount she found in Egyptian mummies were potentially lethal. At first, Balabanova was baffled. But then she had a thought. The high doses in Egyptian bodies could be accounted for if the tobacco, as well as being consumed, had also been used in mummification. Over their 3,000-year history, the Egyptian priests kept the recipes of spices and herbs used to preserve the thousands of people and millions of animals they mummified, a closely guarded secret. The high levels of nicotine in tobacco can kill bacteria. Could it have been one of their secrets? Balabanova looked through old literature about the bodies of the great pharaohs and queens themselves. No longer under the care of the priests, the fragile royal mummies are now kept in strict atmospheric conditions in the Cairo Museum. But Balabanova discovered a story from the days when scientists could still tamper with them. A story that had almost been forgotten. Ramses II died in 1213 BC, a few hundred years before Henot Taui. When he was mummified, every possible skill and every rare magical ingredient was used by the embalmers in their attempts to preserve his body for eternity. For where Henot Taui was only a priestess, Ramses was arguably the mightiest of all the pharaohs. His imposing image adorns most of Egypt's famous sites, for he presided over the golden age of its civilization, and as a skilled military commander, won the conquest that made it into a powerful empire. But what interested Balabanova was what happened to Ramses 3,000 years later, when he went on his final royal visit. Les chercheurs français viennent de révéler qu'ils avaient réalisé de nouvelles découvertes en étudiant la momie du pharaon Ramsès II. Un détachement de la garde républicaine. On September the 26th. 1976, amid all the pomp and circumstance due a visiting head of state, French TV cameras recorded the arrival of the mummy of Ramses II at an airport in Paris. An exhibition about him at the Museum of Mankind was planned. But the body was found to be badly deteriorated and so a battery of scientists set about trying to repair the damage. The bandages wrapped around the mummy needed replacing, and so botanists were given pieces of the fabric to analyze what it was made of. One of them found some plant fragments in her piece and decided to take a closer look. Emerging on the slide, according to her experience, were the unmistakable features, the tiny crystals and filaments, of a plant that couldn't possibly be there. I prepared the slides, I put them under the microscope, and what did I see? Tobacco. I said to myself, that's just not possible, I must be dreaming. The Egyptians didn't have tobacco. 
It was brought from South America at the time of Christopher Columbus. I looked again, and I tried to get a better view, and I thought, well, it's only a first analysis. I worked feverishly, and I forgot to have lunch that day, but I kept getting the same result. Amid a storm of publicity, people alleged, just as they did with Balabanova's results, that this must be a case of contamination. It's a view shared to this day by Ramsey's keeper at the Cairo Museum, who suspects there is a straightforward explanation. According to my knowledge and my experience, uh, most of the archaeologists and scientists been working on these fields uh, they are smoking pipes. And I myself have been smoking pipes for uh, more than 25 years. Then maybe uh, a piece of the tobacco dropped by haphazard or just in a way. And to tell this is right or wrong, we have to be more careful. To combat the allegations of careless smoking, Michel Lesco extracted new samples from deep inside the abdomen of the mummy and took care to document the fact with photographs. And as far as she was concerned, these samples again gave the same result, tobacco. So was Lesco's discovery the proof Balabanova needed for an ancient species of tobacco? For a second opinion, we went to the herbarium at the Natural History Museum to find an expert on tobacco who had seen Lesko's published work. She argued that Lesko's evidence would only identify the family from which tobacco comes and not the specific plant. I think that they had a certain amount of evidence, and they took the evidence one step farther than the evidence really allowed them. There are some times when you can only go so far down a road towards telling what something is, and then you come against a wall which you can't go any farther, otherwise you start to make things up. Sandy Knapp thought the plant from Ramses was more likely to be one of the other members of the tobacco family, which are known to have existed in ancient Egypt, such as henbane, mandrake, or belladonna. I think it is very unlikely that tobacco has an alternative history because I think that we would have heard about it. There would have been some sort of use of it present in either the literature, in temple carvings, somewhere. There would have been some evidence that we could point to and say, ah, that's tobacco. But I, there's nothing. It's true the official theory is that tobacco originates in South America, but it's also true that there are species in Australasia and in the Pacific Islands. There could have been other varieties, ancient varieties of tobacco that existed once in Asia and why not in Africa, varieties that have now disappeared. So it's not sacrilege to challenge the official theory. The jury was still out on a vanished species of tobacco, though Michelle Lesko remained convinced her identification had been correct. But she couldn't help with the cocaine, for it seemed that not even a single botanist believed in a disappearing coca plant. Finding cocaine in these Egyptian mummies, botanically speaking, is almost impossible. I mean, there's always a chance that there might be some sort of plant there or, or something, but I would think that really it's, there's, some, there's some mistake, something's wrong somewhere, because I can't explain it from a plant point of view at all. For thousands of years, people in the Andes have been chewing coca leaves to get out the cocaine with its stimulant, anaesthetic and euphoric properties. There are actually species of the coca family which grow in Africa, but only the South American species have ever been shown to contain the drug. Since cocaine is not in any other plants, Balabanova was completely mystified, but she thought she might have just one possible idea. The cocaine, of course, remains an open question. It's a mystery. It's completely unclear how cocaine could get to Africa. 
On the other hand, we know that there were trade relationships long before Columbus, and it's conceivable that the coca plant could have been imported into Egypt even then. An ancient Egyptian drug trade stretching all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. This was an idea so far-fetched, it could only be considered once all the other ideas had been eliminated. The idea that the Egyptians had been able to obtain imports from a place thousands of miles away, from a continent supposedly not discovered until thousands of years later. Was it possible that coca, a plant from South America, had been finding its way into Egypt 3,000 years ago? If the cocaine found in mummies could not be explained by contamination or fake mummies or by Egyptian plants containing the drug, there appeared to be only one remaining possibility, an ancient international drug trade whose links extended all the way to the Americas. To obtain incense, myrrh and other valuable plants used in religious ceremonies and herbal medicines, it's true, the Egyptians were prepared to go to great lengths. Even if traders, just as today, might have made all sorts of exotic claims for the source of their products, there is nevertheless clear evidence of ancient contacts as far east as Syria and Iraq. They also extended north into Cyprus, south into Sudan and Somalia, and west into Libya. But America? To the majority of archaeologists, the idea is hardly worth talking about. The idea that the Egyptians should have travelled to America is overall absurd. I don't know of anyone who is professionally employed as an Egyptologist or anthropologist or archaeologist who seriously believes in any of these possibilities. And I also don't know anyone who spends time doing research in these areas because they're not perceived to be areas that have any real meaning for the subjects. But on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, where the moving current of the Gulf Stream arrives in Mexico, directly from the west coast of Africa, there is a professionally employed anthropologist who does seriously believe in such possibilities. I think there is good evidence that there was both transatlantic and transpacific travel before Columbus. When you try to talk about trans-oceanic contact, people that are uh, standard archaeologists get very uh, skittish. And they uh, want to change the subject or move away. Sometimes you see suddenly see a friend across the room. They don't want to pursue the subject at all. They seem to feel it's some kind of contagious, horrible disease they don't want to touch or it will bring disaster to them. Why was the mere contemplation of voyages before Columbus or the Viking crossings to America thought to be some sort of curse? It was in 1910 that a group of early anthropologists began to theorize that the stepped pyramids in Mexico might not have been the invention of American Indians. Could the technology have come from the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, from Egypt, where there were also stepped pyramids? After spotting other transatlantic similarities, these anthropologists began to argue that all civilization was invented in Egypt and later handed down to what they regarded as more primitive societies. 
The implication that old world culture was superior was thought acceptable at that time. But the arrival of modern dating techniques showed that the similarities were far more likely to be independent developments. For example, the Egyptians turned out to have abandoned pyramids with steps in favor of smooth ones 2,000 years before the first stepped pyramids occur in the Americas. What's more, the suggestion that American Indians couldn't build their own civilizations became highly unpopular. Despite a brief revival in the 1970s, when anthropologist Tor Heyerdahl crossed the Atlantic on a primitive reed boat, research into ancient contacts with America was frowned on, even if now unconnected with theories of cultural superiority. But the idea that the ability of the ancients to cross oceans might have been underestimated has continued to be quietly whispered about. And over the years, evidence has grown, which suggests it might be time to look again at such voyages. To imagine that the Egyptians, who apparently only sailed up and down the Nile or into the Red Sea, might get as far as the Americas, perhaps sounds fantastical. But in science, what is one day thought absurd, can the next become accepted as fact. One senior academic thinks it's important to remember that before the discovery of this Norse settlement in Newfoundland in 1965, theories about Viking voyages to America were dismissed as nonsense. What we've seen is a shift from the idea of Viking landings in America being seen as completely fantastic or, or part, partisan uh, to their being accepted by every scholar in the field. The fact that evidence of the Viking crossings was hidden has encouraged Martin Bernal to contemplate even earlier voyages that are likewise presently dismissed as impossible. I have no reason to doubt that there were others, but what they were and how much influence they had on American society is very much uh, open to question, but, uh, but that transoceanic voyages are possible or were possible uh, seems to me overwhelmingly likely. A likelihood Bernal believes is reinforced by some Roman jars found in 1975 in a place called the Bay of Jars in Brazil. It's been suggested a Roman galley could be buried under the sea, but the interpretation of such finds is heavily disputed. But they would fit the possibility that there was the odd ship that by mistake ended up uh, on the other side of the Atlantic. What they're not going to fit is the idea of sustained two-way contact because there is a huge amount of historical evidence from the Roman world and there is nothing whatever that suggests that such contact existed. They can't have been planted because uh, the, the bay was known as the Bay of Jars since the 18th century so that uh, Roman jars have been turning up and this links up with uh, indirect Roman uh, documentary evidence uh, of, uh, of contact. The Bay of Jars is only one of several oddities claimed as evidence of transatlantic contacts. Also in Brazil is an inscription said to be in an ancient Mediterranean language. Meanwhile in Mexico there are 3,000 year old figurines with beards, a feature unknown in Native Americans of the region plus colossal statues that are said to look African. And an apparent picture of a pineapple, an American fruit, has been found in Pompeii. But if tobacco from Mexico or coca from the Andes was carried across an ocean, it apparently need not have been the Atlantic. According to Alice Kehoe, a number of other American plants mysteriously turn up outside what was meant to be a sealed continent, 
but they are found on the other side of the Pacific. The one that absolutely proves trans-Pacific voyaging is the sweet potato. There are also discoveries of peanuts more than 2,000 years ago in western China. There is a temple in southern India that has sculptures of goddesses holding what look like ears of maize or corn. And if American maize might have got as far as India, why couldn't tobacco or coca have reached Egypt? They could have come across the Pacific to China or Asia and then overland to Africa. The Egyptians need not have traveled to America at all or even known where the plants originated, but could have got them indirectly through a network of world trade. But any ancient trade route that includes America is unacceptable in archaeology. I don't think it's at all likely that there was an ancient trade network with America. The essential problem with any such idea is that there are no artifacts to back it up that have been found either in Europe or in America. And I know that people produce examples of possible things, but they're really very implausible. Yet the recent discovery of minute strands of silk in the hair of a mummy from Luxor could suggest trade stretching from Egypt to the Pacific. For silk at this time is only known to have been made in China. Martin Bernal argues that it would be a pity to replace earlier cultural arrogance with an arrogant belief in progress. We're getting more and more evidence of world trade at an earlier stage. I mean, you have the Chinese silk definitely arriving in Egypt by 1000 BC. Uh, I think there's been a tendency for modern scholars to believe rigidly in progress and the idea that you could only have a worldwide trading network from the 18th century on is part of our own temporal arrogance that it's only modern people who can do these things. The evidence for ancient trade with America is limited and most of it is disputed. But it can't be completely ruled out as an explanation for the apparent impossibility of Balabanova's results. Results that at first seemed so absurd, many thought they would be explained away by a simple story of a botch up in a lab. Results that, still without firm explanation, continue to crop up in unexpected places. For in Manchester, the mummies under the care of Rosalie David, the Egyptologist once so sure Balabanova had made a mistake, produced some odd results of their own. We've received results back from the tests on our mummy tissue samples and two of the tissue samples and the one hair sample both have evidence of nicotine in them and I'm really very surprised at this. The results of the tests on the Manchester mummies have made me very happy. After all these years of being accused of producing false results, contaminated results and things like that. So I was delighted to hear that nicotine was found in these mummies and very, very happy to have this enormous confirmation of my work. The tale of Henot Taui shows that in science, facts can be rejected if they don't fit with our beliefs. While what is believed proven may actually be uncertain. Little wonder then that a story that began with one scientist, a few mummies, and some routine tests, in no time at all, could upset whole areas of knowledge we thought we could take for granted. <laughs> <laughs>